Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 9. Now, the Bible says, For we are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. And you are God's husbandry and you are God's building. The Bible says we are laborers together with God. Tell your neighbor I'm a laborer together with God. We are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. Now, in the whole Bible, from beginning to the end, there is only one scripture in such rendering and deliberate words written and spoken through the spirit and work in the apostle Paul. There is nowhere in the Bible God has spoken that deeply. You see, when the Bible says we are laborers, the Greek word is sunago, right? Sunago. When the Bible says that we are laborers, sunago or sunagos, there is 13 Places in scripture where the word laborers is, sunagos or sunago, sunago or sunagos, whatever you choose. There's 13 places in scripture where that is written. And in all the 13 places in scripture, all the 12 refer to men, right? We fellow men. For example, when somebody says, my fellow laborer, uh, Barnabas, or our fellow laborer, Timotheus, or our fellow laborer, Silvanus, we come to help with thee. Thank those women which helped us, which sunagot with us. There's 13 scriptures in the New Testament with the same rendering sunago of sunagos. But all the 12 of the 13 are referring to men, referring to each other as fellow laborers or co-laborers or fellow helpers in the work of the kingdom. This is the only one time in the New Testament and in history of scripture, where God gets the laborer, the individual you, and he says that you are together with him in the labor. <laughs> Who has understood what I just said? This is the only time Sunagos is spoken of in scripture and it is relating the believer together with God. Somebody shout hallelujah. That means whether you know it or not. I don't know how long you've been in the faith. I don't know what you are doing in the faith. I don't know what you plan to do in the faith. But this is what I know. That everybody at the sound of my voice, even beyond, anybody that has professed the name of Jesus Christ is a laborer in the kingdom of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. You might not be able yet to do certain things or some of you come or go to church and you know you hear the word and enjoy and get delivered. You know you get blessed in whichever way. You're not yet doing something in the kingdom of God. But I hope that is a temporary condition that is going to end soon. Each one of you must serve God a certain way. There is no life of Christianity if you're not a servant of the almighty God. In fact, I tell people, it doesn't matter how much money you have, how much fame you have, how much celebrity you are, how much connections you are, how much wise you appear, how much elated you are to men. If you're not serving God, you're bound. You're bound. The Bible says, let my people go that they might what? Serve me. The true ideal understanding of a man who is free is a man who serves God. If you don't serve God yet, it doesn't matter how much freedom looks like is around you, you're still bound by something. Everybody must be able to serve God. 
Somebody shout hallelujah. We were called to be servants of the most high God. We carry the responsibility of being servants and ministers of the gospel. And that's why I tell people, how can you say, be three years in the gospel and you're not doing anything in the kingdom? It's not possible. It should not be possible. At least three years is enough to give a man a new language, a new tongue, an attitude, a certain understanding. It's enough to prepare a man for any form of ministry. If you're three years in the gospel and you're not serving God yet, you need deliverance. Deep deliverance. Praise God. Because we are anointed to serve. The Bible says he translated us from the kingdom of darkness into light that we might serve him. In Luke, he has delivered us with all the de deliverance. The Bible says that we might serve him. So we are free because we are able to serve him. Praise God. The Bible says we were called that we should be saved, that he granted to us that we are being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. The Bible says might serve him without fear. Give me the message of that. The message Bible says a clean rescue from enemy camp so that we can worship him without a care in the world. It's service. Praise God. At a particular point, the deliverance of God on your life is that you will serve him. You must serve God. You must serve God. You must find something to do. Even if it means sweeping, sweep, but do something for God. Praise God. No matter where you are and how educated you are and how connected you are, you need to serve God a certain way. That's the only thing that defines your freedom in Christ. No matter the things that you're going through, by the way. Troubles will come and go. Are you hearing me? But the confidence in your spirit that these things are temporal and I will outlive them by faith is the result of you serving God. When you say, God, I'm going to serve you, it means you are persuaded of your freedom in Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. But deeper than that, of course, in that understanding, when we are given such a glorious blessing for God to say that we are laborers together with God. You see, he could have said we are laborers of God. We are laborers for God. That's all fine and true. But he has said we are laborers together with God. That there's a certain place where God puts you with him when it comes to service. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, why am I going there? Because many times when we are talking about the Christian faith, okay, they tell you or it is believed or it has been researched and proved that the Pentecostal, for example, the born again movement, Pentecostal, has more than a thousand denominations. And more than a thousand denominations means that I can make a statement and many people here will not agree with me. But neither will they also agree with the one who doesn't agree with me. But neither will they also agree with the one who doesn't agree with me, who doesn't agree with them, who doesn't agree with me. You're dealing with the people who everyone has their own understanding about God. And sometimes, in fact, all the time, our prayer by God is that at least he will bring a certain sanity of understanding in the doctrine, the teaching of the person of Jesus Christ and his ministry present day. The Bible doesn't say, as he was, so are you. The Bible says, as he is, so are you. Where is Christ now? Where is he in the spirit? When we're talking about intercession, what is his place in intercession? Because you can't understand your labors with him until you understand where he is. Why does the church exist? Why does fellowship of brethren exist? Why do we have the fivefold ministry? We have all of these for the perfecting of the saints to the work of ministry. Perfecting of the saints to the work of ministry. Perfecting of the saints to the work of ministry. Everything that you're hearing every Thursday, every Sunday in your church, all of this is there to perfect you for the work of ministry that the body will be edified. Praise God. That the body would be edified. The edification of the body of Christ comes when every saint is working in the ministry. And the essence of the fivefold is to perfect you. You might not be perfect yet, but you're on the road. That's okay. The Bible says he prunes those that produce fruit. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
You might still be a work in progress, but you want to serve God. Yes, find something you can do, but do something for God. Do something for God. Praise God. But then Paul, beyond that now, tries to bring a certain understanding, a certain consciousness and reality to the new creation. In fact, when Paul is writing in Colossians, uh, chapter 1, verses 28, when he's talking about why we preach Jesus Christ, why do we preach Christ and him crucified? Because Paul tells you, and as among you, I saw to know nothing and I was acquainted of nothing, save Christ and him crucified. Now, the Bible says, when we preach Christ, we are warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. The Bible says that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Because we can speak and teach and talk about many things that pertain what you and I call faith. But if at the end of the day we are not perfecting you in Christ Jesus, then our labors are fruitless. They're futile. They're not going anywhere. I know that many of us have been raised in traditional understanding of the faith. And some people think that every time you come in the presence of God, you're coming before a witch doctor. Who you're coming to tell your problems of who is bewitching you, who is not bewitching you, who is disturbing you, who disturbed you at the job, who is speaking evil things about you, such that you can send fire. You understand? And when fire is destroyed, you say, hey, eh, he was standing against me. Eh? You see what I've done to him. Eh? Praise God. God, you are good. Hallelujah. And so some of you, you have very personal things against each other. And then you find someone seeking God such that God will present fire on somebody. And so you're using God to fight your small little wars with your niece and nephew and cousin and your workmate and your neighbor. You understand who you're competing with without, you, you get it. Some people think God blesses them to make their enemies feel bad only. No, that is just those extra things that come with a blessing. Even if your enemy was not against you, the blessing of God is still upon your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. But you see, the Bible says we labor that we might present you perfect in Christ. Not to Christ, but perfect in Christ. In Christ. You know, when we started to preach these things years ago, our fear was that people might not understand. Because some people used to think, but these things you're speaking, are they... How do they connect with the reality of human beings? But you see, as I was continued preaching, we started to realize people were getting it more than other people thought. Because, you see, the essence of the gospel, the good news, right, is that God will create a certain glory in your life. You did not become born again. Let me translate it in English. I did not get born again to fail. I am persuaded of the God who ordained you. I am persuaded of the plans that he has towards you. Plans of peace. Plans to mock you prosper, not to harm you. To give you that expected end. Somebody shout hallelujah. You are not in the gospel for nothing. Some things might not be evident yet. But give it time. Sometimes an egg can be under incubation and you think, hmm, what's happening outside? But inside there is something happening. And one day, just one day, bah, somebody shout hallelujah. Tell your neighbor it's a matter of time. Don't be deceived at what you see. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, why do we labor to present all men perfect in Christ? Because you can live this life of Christianity and die without having seen, experienced, understood what it means to be perfect, complete in him. And if that is not happening, you will not have a certain joy, the joy that comes with Christianity. The Bible says the thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. But what did he say he comes for? He says, I am come that you might have what? Life, praise God. The Amplified says, I am come that you might have life and have and enjoy it and have it more abundantly to the full until it overflows. That is why Jesus came. And I plan to enjoy life. Oh, I don't know whether I have a witness. I plan to enjoy the Christian life. I plan to have it in abundance 
full until it overflows. If you believe it, shout amen. amen. Praise God. I was ordained for a certain grace. I was ordained for a certain glory. I was called for something bigger than what men can see. Doesn't matter which nation I'm at. Doesn't matter my color. Doesn't matter who knows me and who doesn't. Doesn't matter who hears me and who doesn't. The point is that I've believed God that I must enjoy this life. And I will to the fullest. Somebody shout hallelujah. And even in heaven, I will enjoy more. He said, oh, but you know, you're saying those things, but you know, when you go in the Bible, there's clear evidences of men struggling with this and that. No, no. It's you who reads it in your eyes. In their eyes, the Bible says, they count it all but joy. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says, count it all but joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The men you're talking about, when stuff came, when attacks came, they were clapping and jumping. They were not weeping and wailing like you think. Because they know who they are. Everything that comes against you, if it is destructive, the end is for your glory. And I mean everything. Tell your neighbor, and I mean everything. Tell your neighbor, and I mean everything. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, when he gets into the place of us laboring to present men perfect in Christ, in chapter 2 Colossians, he's trying to explain how this perfection comes. And that's what I'm seeking tonight. To give you a certain understanding of what it means to be perfect in Christ. To give you certain realities that are beyond your usual understanding of the things of the kingdom. Such that you'll enjoy the perfection that comes with Christ. Listen, when you understand this thing, you won't need the deliverance service. When you understand this thing, you will not need to look for a man of God to tell you what he sees. I'm telling you. When you understand this thing, <laughs> you won't need to go to look for a man of God. What has God told you about? You won't. Why? Because there is a perfection that comes in God and deals with everything that would have troubled you, even that plans to trouble you. Somebody shout hallelujah. The word of God works. The word of God works. Tell your neighbor the word of God works. It works. It works. It works. It works. Now, in Colossians chapter 2 from verse 6, he says, As ye therefore have received Jesus Christ, now this is the essence. Now we're trying to perfect men in Christ. Remember when in chapter 1, we explained how we are laboring to bring all men perfect in Christ. Now in chapter 2, he's continuing to explain how this perfection comes. Now the Bible says, as you've therefore received Christ Jesus, what do you do? What do you do? So walk ye in him. The Bible says, rooted and what? Are you hearing these words? As you have received him, walk ye in him. How do you walk in him? The consciousness that you are rooted and built up in him. Firstly, you must know that you are rooted and built up. You are rooted and built up in Christ. You must know that you have the roots of your being. You have the roots of your being. You know, some of you love the funny lines. You're not my human being. No, listen. <laughs> oh, Rakata. Listen, if the Bible says that you have your roots of being in him, what are you? Don't fear. No, no, no. no. Look, at, look at religion. Huh? Huh? What do you mean? Listen, don't overthink this. Understand it. If the Bible says that you have the roots of your being firmly and deeply planted in him, fixed, listen, and founded in him. What being are you? Who are you? See, now I know what religious people are thinking, huh? Where is it going with this? Seriously, where is it going with this? Listen, where is the Amplified Bible going in this? Where is the KJV going in it? Where is the Bible you're reading taking you? 
the Bible says you have roots of your being, firmly and deeply planted in him, fixed and founded in him. Selah. Meditate about it. Think it. No, don't just imagine it in your head. Close your eyes for a moment and see your being being rooted and founded in him. Are you hearing me? Every joint, every marrow, every sinew, the blood that flows in your body, the veins that are inside you, your heart, your kidneys, your lungs, your eyes. Oh! And then the doctor tells you you're sick. You know, sometimes we read stuff and we think we understand it. But the word of God must be an experience. It has to be a place you go to and have the full apprehension of the things that are really spoken of you. Is it true that your being is firmly fixed and founded in Christ? He says, that's how you walk in him. See, when I'm talking about walking in the spirit, some people have a very, very inferior understanding of walking in the spirit. Why do I mean by that when I say some people have an inferior understanding of walking in the spirit? Because of false teaching. Many of you have been alienated from the life which is in Christ. Every time you're relating with God, you're relating with him as one who is not one with you. And your service, your piety, your worship, your praise is just trying to get, draw closer to him. That's your understanding. <laughs> Let me tell you. One time, the Spirit of the Lord was teaching me something very interesting. He told me, because I used to hear men teaching. I'm going to teach you how to enter and walk in the Spirit. Right? Right? But you see, enter and walk. We can teach you how to walk, but we can't teach you how to enter. That's false teaching. I'll tell you why. When you become born again, you are a spirit. Now, how can you teach a spirit to be a spirit? That's inferior. That's of the inferior kind and nature of everything that spells carnality. Because when you become born again, you inherited a realm. Isn't it? The Bible says the kingdom of God comes upon you when you receive Christ. Now the word therefore kingdom is realm. When Jesus tells you that my kingdom is not of this world, when you receive Christ, you have entered the spirit realm, albeit in the higher life. You have entered the spirit realm in a higher life. Do you understand what I'm saying? The only way you can come out of that realm and life is if you denounce Christ. And say, from today, I don't. But as long as you're still a believer in Christ, you're up there. You understand? And you're in the spirit. We can teach you to walk there, but we can't teach you to enter. Because I always tell people, if you're the kind who comes out of the spirit, where do you be? Do you understand? If you say, now I'm... Let me enter the spirit realm. Rakata. Then you enter the spirit realm. Now, before you entered, <laughs> before you entered, where were you? Praise God. We missed you. Are you hearing me? That in effect alienates you from the life which is of God because of your ignorance. Now you know from today when somebody says I'm teaching you to enter. <laughs> Tell him I'm in. Let's talk about walking. But let's not talk about me entering. I'm there. Oh Rikata. I even feel it already. Ruba Satanapa. I sleep there. I wake up there. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. Even when I'm in the bathroom. I'm there. Are you hearing me? Even when I'm walking, playing football or basketball. Do you understand what I'm saying? But you have people who have conversations like. He was lucky. He found me in the spirit. You're like. He was lucky he found me in the spirit. I was going to 
walking with him. <laughs> Praise God. Somebody say, I'm of the spirit. Born of the spirit. I live there. It's my being and life. Because Christ is a spirit. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Now, let's continue to this thing. We need you perfected in Christ. Now, you're being continually built up in him. Becoming, listen, increasingly more confirmed and established in the faith. That means everything we're teaching you is building you up. But in him, not outside him. Praise God. And the Bible says, just as you were taught and abounding and overflowing in it with thanksgiving. Just as you were taught and abounding and overflowing it in it with thanksgiving. How do we abound? How do we overflow? How do we relate with the reality and manifestation of these things with thanksgiving? That means when you're praying, are you hearing me? Say, Abba, Father. Oh. Woo! I thank you because I'm in you. Every fiber of my being breathes you. But some of you in your private prayer, Lord, you seem so far away. <laughs> Thank you, God, because you're in me. Lord, you seem so far away. Thank you, God, because in you I live. I move and have my own being. Praise God. Hallelujah. And he says, as you continue doing that, you abound and overflow. Take five seconds and thank him. Come on. Rirazobrozikata. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Thank you God because I'm in you. Thank you God because everything in me is connected to you. Thank you God because the current of the spirit is flowing through my body. It's flowing through my veins. It's flowing through my understanding. It's flowing through my meditation. It's flowing through everything I see. It's flowing through everywhere I go. It's flowing through everywhere I stay. It's flowing through every plan I have. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I'm led of the Holy Ghost because it's in me. I can't go the wrong way. I can't have the wrong thoughts. I can't have the wrong friends. I can't connect to the wrong thing. And the Bible says, overflow. Shout glory. Now, the next verse says, he now brings the warning. He tells you, beware. Least any man spoil. Do you see how men are spoiled? You see, some of you, some of you think spoiling you is somebody who takes you and then, you, you know, he makes you do that. No, no, no. Let me tell you real spoiling. Because some of you are spoiled. He says, list any man spoil you through philosophy. Give me the amplified. No one carries you off and spoils you or makes you yourselves captive by your so-called philosophy. Right? Because those are the things that bring captivity to people. Intellectualism has captivated men. People are weak. They are not functional fully in the spirit because they are so intellectual. Everything they teach you, you want to apply your Kalito education. you Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawkins. Pure math. Biology. Psychology. English. Hey, English. Like back in the day, we used to think that the guys who have accents are clever. Until we started doing exams with them. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, those guys used to have very nice accents, and then you sit down in class, <laughs> and the guy just... <laughs> Praise God. So, he says, men are brought to captivity through philosophies, intellectualisms and vain deceit, idle fancies and plain notions. 
they follow human traditions, men's ideas of the material rather than the spiritual world. Did you hear that? Men's ideas of the material rather than the spiritual world. So men bring ideas of how the material world works and they give impression to people, right? They give a certain impression to people who are of the spirit world to relate with material things as men of the material world. Do you know that you can wake up tomorrow morning, right? 12 hours from now, you can wake up a billionaire in dollars. Now, there's a guy who is not born again. If he hears this, he'll say, no sense. <laughs> the intellectual is speaking. See, the gospel is foolishness. You see, every time I read this word, I used to say, but God, eh? the things I read, sometimes I wish some of you see, there are things I read, and they, I say, but no God, no, 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 Whatsoever you shall ask in my no God. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name. Come on, slap yourself. Did you understand what I just said? Listen, I don't care whether you don't agree with me. Stay with your educated mind. Are you hearing me? If the Bible says that this is so, it is so. That is why every time we go in the realities of the kingdom, there is many things that can't be articulated in the simple understanding of people. A man woke up one day and gave the price, right? Of, of taxation, right? He gave taxation a price that was not recorded in the economy. Of the Jews. A man comes to him and tells him, you know, we don't have taxes. He said, go to a fish. Whatever fish comes out. Now, I wish you think for a moment that somehow money had to be manufactured <laughs> out of a fish. God made money out of a fish. Jesus Christ paid taxes out of the mouth of a fish. He told him the first one, don't even try him when you, no, no, the first fish that comes out, go pay enough for you and me. You'll be good. Now, what consciousness would Christ have under any need? Think with me. Those of you who lose appetite and sleep because you don't have school fees. What consciousness would Christ have? If he has the ability to tell someone, go in a fish and find, go in a fish and find money. And it was so. Now, that alone if you think about it, can bring inflation in any nation. Because it's bringing currencies that are not accounted for. That alone tells you that the economy of the kingdom of God is different from the economy of this world. If this world has money, you have a way to make it. You're not subject to the budget of this country. You're not subject to the budget of your country. You're not subject to the currency of your people. No. Yours is rika braje ketele prakata labaye. Even when you go in Germany, they can understand. Riba zoko prokotala pakata yaba. This one is international. Tell your neighbor perfect in Christ. I decree and I declare that from today in the name of Jesus Christ, may you never carry any consciousness.
to lack in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. A man says that tomorrow at the gate of Samaria, yeah, he says that two, two measures of barley are going to cost the shekel. This is a man. A man of God has said that tomorrow, next morning, at the gate of Samaria, two measures of barley are going to cost a shekel. They weren't costing a shekel. No. He stated the price that a commodity had to be bought. Ooh-wee. If you have that understanding, you can decrease something tomorrow morning and buy it 1% of its original price and they sell it to you at that price. And the rest buy 100% of it. If you've understood it, shout hallelujah. You can even buy it without money. Now, how can you be poor? Slap yourself. Praise God. You cannot be poor. You cannot be poor. You cannot be poor. You can't. It doesn't matter whether the landlord told you tomorrow morning. Yes. But God wants to get you to the level where you can tell the landlord tomorrow morning you'll find your money on your dressing table. <laughs> intellectuals, look at intellectuals. Look, look, look at philosophers. <laughs> Praise God. But you better have faith. Because if you tell the landlord and he didn't find his money there, no sense. Praise God. The gospel is crazier than you think. I say the gospel is crazier than you think. It's crazier than you think. It's crazier than you think. Somebody said hallelujah. How many of you were there that during that time, it was many years ago, when I told a young girl that money is going to appear, who was there? Put up your hands. You're my witnesses. This girl was broke and she needed money. Da, 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 da. They were there because she testified. And I told her, money is going to appear for you. Believe God by tomorrow morning. She says, as she was walking, money just fell. She didn't find it down. Money just fell. You don't need to believe me intellectual she picks the bundle and it was two million shillings and it was enough for her need I wish she asked for more rakata rabako sekete bakata somebody shout hallelujah I'm a believer. Tell your neighbor I'm a believer. I said I'm a believer. I said I'm a believer. And I exercise myself to the same. Vineyards you never planted. Houses you never built. In the mighty name of Jesus. And don't worry. That wealth comes with responsibility. We feed the widow and the orphan. We build a ministry to the glory of God. It doesn't make us, we make it. Recently, I was talking to somebody who is well versed about how they make money. I don't know what the time is, it's sooner age or something. They told me that the money you need to buy a coin is more expensive than the amount you write on that coin. That means money is bought. But what is money? Money is an idea. A man just adds zeros on. Says, you want, can we print a 10,000 note? Yes. He goes in front of the 1,000 note, puts zero, adds salient features and gives color. And it becomes money. And that's the thing guards stand on in front of the bank. They are guarding ideas. 
you understand what I just said? That means that what you think is money is actually not money. That is why in Isaiah he tells you, come without money and buy. The Christian is not supposed to buy with money. The Christian is not supposed to buy with money. No. The Christian buys with faith. It's our currency. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. That's why people who make money can't steal it. Because you pay them more for every amount they make. Now, let's go back to philosophers. Now, the Bible tells you that when you become so filled and diffused with the thoughts of this world, slowly by slowly, you're getting spoiled. You think the way the world makes it is the way you're going to make it. You even become wicked in the process because the world is wicked in its getting. Somebody shout hallelujah. But you see, he says, these are crude notions following the rudimentary and elemental teachings of the universe and disregarding the teaching of Christ the Messiah. The next verse says, for in him, listen, listen to the understanding. He says, for in him, the whole fullness of the deity, which is the God, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. This is Christ. In him, all the Godhead, the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. Now, understand this. Paul is trying to get you from the way the world thinks, to get you to the mind that should perfect you in Christ if you continue to exercise yourself in thanksgiving and meditation of the same. He's trying to get you into the overflow with this understanding. Because remember in chapter 1 he's telling you we're laboring that we might present you perfect in Christ. Now he's here telling you, live what the world says. This Jesus you have received, in him dwells all the Godhead, the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And the next verse says, and ye are in him made full. And having come to fullness of life in Christ, you too, intellectuals, you too, he said, are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh my God. No, no, no. Listen, the Bible says, are you thinking? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? He said, and you are in him, made full, made full, and having come to fullness of life in Christ, you too, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and rich full spiritual stature, and he is the head of all rule, and authority of every angelic principality and power. Breathe that thing in. Oh God. He's trying to tell you. Me and you. We are one. If all the fullness of God dwells in me bodily. You too. You too. You too. Carry the fullness of God bodily. That means you don't have dots and portions of God. You know, he gave you some. He also gave the other one some. And the, no. Woo. Praise God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Ye are complete in him. He says ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality. That's what he's trying to tell you. That when you are talking about being in Christ, there is nothing lacking, nothing missing. In fact, the Greek word for complete is pleru. It means that you are filled to the brim and nothing you want is not in you by full measure. <laughs> Did you understand what I just said? Everything you're believing God for is in you by full measure. In fact, Pleru is you're liberally supplied. That means you have more than you need. Every day, you have more than you need. 
Look at intellectuals. Somebody has thought about their bank account. Tell your neighbor, I have more than I need. It means you carry the full effect of the realization, the manifestation of every promise spoken in scripture. Every prophecy spoken in scripture. Every word spoken. Every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. You carry the fullness of that thing without any shortage. And when it comes to the execution of the office, the very word of completion there means that when God says you are a pastor, it means he has given you everything a pastor will ever need. When he says you are an apostle, he has given you everything an apostle will ever need. When he says that you are a preacher, he has given you everything that a preacher will ever need. When he says you're a businessman, slap yourself. He has given you everything that you'll ever need to be a success in the business world. When he says you're an engineer, he has given you everything that will make you the best engineer on the face of the earth. When he says that you're a worshiper, he has given you every sufficiency to get a lame man and a blind eye open. When he says he has made you, he says ye are complete in him. We labor to present men perfect in Christ. That you don't walk disadvantaged. You don't feel like, oh, that will change the way you pray. You stop asking God what happened to me. Everything happened to you. Somebody shout hallelujah. When Jesus came, he gave you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You're right, everything happens to you. When Jesus came, he gave you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Everything happened to you. And you know, Christians carry a certain victimization. Why is it that everybody is successful, but I'm not successful, apostle? Who told you you're not successful? You've been spoiled. You're comparing yourself against the world. And in comparing yourself against the world, you think that you are poor, you're weak, you're beggarly, you're sick. We labor that we might present men perfect in Christ. We labor that we might tell them that ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And everything that was in the Christ is in the Christ is in you. Everything. You know, I see people who say stuff they can't manifest and I feel sorry for them because I can almost tell that it's here. It's not here. Get this thing out of your head. Just tell it sink in my soul. Get into my spirit. Tell it. Tell it. Tell it. Because you see, we have to get to a level where people look at our results and say, truly, these guys are not playing. Tell your neighbor we are not playing. We are serious. This is the word of God and we believe it. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Now, that is why when he gets into the space of Ephesians, when he's talking about the mystery of his will, let's open there in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 8. When God was talking about this, when he's trying to give that understanding, I want you to see where Paul comes from to make the prayers he's making for the church. He says, he has abounded to us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, when the Bible says that God has abounded to us in all wisdom and prudence, in the next line, Paul is trying to explain the result of that wisdom and prudence. Are you following? He's trying to explain to you and I the result of that wisdom and prudence in which he has abounded unto us. He continues to say, listen, how that wisdom and prudence is. Having made known unto us, listen, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in him. Listen. The wisdom and prudence abounded to us by the person of Christ is the full revelation of understanding the mystery of his will. 
not understanding his will, but understanding the mystery of his will. Not understanding his will. Not in the understanding of how he thinks and what he intends, but in the deeper line of the mystery of how he thinks and he intends. That is the place of understanding what is the wisdom of God. When we're talking about the wisdom of God, when you say that this man or woman has the understanding, he has the wisdom and prudence of the spirit. And when the Bible speaks of the wisdom of the prudent, he speaks of how people get the revelation of the way of God. When he's speaking about this wisdom, when they say this Christian is wise, this person is prudent in the spirit, that person understands the mind behind the reason, the ways and purpose of how God willed. That's Proverbs 14 verse 8. He says the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. Right? Not only that person, but also the way of God. When we're talking about this wisdom, he's telling you, for example, healing. Right? We all know that God wills to heal. Isn't it? So nobody can come and say, ah, that one. Some people, he makes the choice to heal and some, they die. You understand what I'm saying? Some people say, ah, it was the choice of God that that person died and then the other person died. That's where you are. You're spoiled. When the Bible says by his stripes you were healed, it means you were healed. Whether you still feel sick, whether you've prayed and fasted and the disease is still there, it doesn't change the reality of God's will. You'll know that there will never be a place where he will not want you healed. He's past willing to heal. He has healed you. So we're not even talking about will. But when the Bible talks about the mystery, understanding the mystery of his will, the mystery, the secret of his will. When the Bible says that he has abounded to us through all wisdom and prudence by having made known unto us the mystery of his will. He's saying, I didn't just tell you my intention and will concerning life. I took time to tell you the mind behind why and how I intended these things. And you say, when did you do it? Like I said, certain realities can be understood through the spirit of faith. Nobody can explain these things to you until you understand how faith works. Because there's somebody who's saying, but me, I don't understand that mystery. Because you don't believe the reality of what is spoken in scripture. This is not in the space of studying to understand. This is in the space of believing to understand. By faith we understand. You understand? Hebrews 11.3. He says, by faith we understand. This is in the class of the things you understand by faith. And as you continue understanding these things by faith, the reality of those things starts to manifest in your life. I don't know how. All I know is that the reality of those things starts to manifest in your life. At least believe. That you carry the wisdom and prudence of the spirit enough to have understanding of the mystery of his will. Did you hear what I just said? Now, the Bible says it's according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself. And the next verse says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, right? Why you know that mystery? That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things that are in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. When you read the amplified of that he said that, that he planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ. Now the word they are consummate is the same word complete. Pleru. It's to the intent that when this consciousness hits you, there is a time that is appointed by the Spirit that all of that completion comes into reconciliation in Him. That you and everything that pertains to you starts to come in unison. That everything around you starts to agree with that reality. Have you understood what I just said? That's the consummation. If a consummation is play rule, that's the completion. He's talking about, when he's talking about you're complete in him. He's saying you cannot get into this completion until you understand that he has made known unto you the mystery 
of his will. When you believe that he has made known unto you the mystery of his will, a certain understanding starts to open up in your spirit that brings consciousness to the faith and gives grace to interpret that mystery. Such that you don't walk according to what you know God does. You walk according to how you know what God does. Who has understood what he has said? So you don't just know what God does. You also know how he does it. <laughs> Woo. And if you know how he does it. There was a question in Job where he said, can you explain how a bone is formed up in a mother's womb? Right? That question was to an unregenerated nature of man. A new creation should not be asked whether it knows how a bone is formed in a woman's body. It knows. Okay, how? I might not be able to explain to you how, but I know how. Okay. Maybe you bring me a broken bone. It says that when I heal it, you will know that even though I don't have words to explain how, if a place comes where a bone is needed, I know how. Ah. Did you understand what I just said? the essence of the anointing. He says you have an unction from on high. He says you know all things. What? Do you know all things? Are you sure? Yes. How do you know you know them? I don't know how I know them. But I know that I know all things through Christ. And then people say, of course you're a human being. You don't know everything. In the human nature. But when you teach in his being, rooted in him, I know. Imagine a guy who is in trouble and then he calls you and says, I don't know what to do. You understand what I'm saying? Even when you're under trouble, just tell yourself, I know what to do. I know how to come out of this. The spirit of God in me cannot let me sink. I have an action from on high. I know all things. Listen, I have realized that when you exercise yourself in such manner, even when you are not able to grasp certain realities in the knowledge of the spirit, somehow certain things start aligning themselves to your life and knowledge. And you're going to be amazed that you'll start to see progress in your knowledge in God. You'll start to see the spirit of revelation working through you in the most amazing ways. But it has to begin through faith. Now he continues and says in the next verse. In him we also. Now again he's trying to make a certain point. In him we also were made God's heritage. We were made God's portion. And we obtained an inheritance. For we have been foreordained chosen and appointed beforehand in accordance with his purpose who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and designs of his own will next verse so that we who first hoped in Christ who first put our confidence in him have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory God knows that you are ordained to live to the praise of his glory next verse says in whom also you've heard the word of truth, the glad tidings, the gospel of your trial and salvation, and have believed in and adhered to and relied on him, were stamped with the seal of the long promise of the Holy Spirit. That means when you have the Holy Spirit, that is the guarantee. Slap yourself. That is the guarantee. He says, that spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, the first fruits, the pledge, and the fortest, the down payment on our heritage. He said, you know, you're supposed to live the God life. Proof, Holy Ghost. Now you have the down payment. You have the guarantee. When you know that you have the Holy Ghost. And he says, 
in anticipation of its full redemption and our acquiring complete possession of it to the praise of his glory. And the next verse says, for this reason, now you see why he prays, for this thing I was explaining, because I've heard of your faith in this thing, in the Lord, and your love toward all saints, that's why I don't cease to pray for you. Now you understand why he prays for them? He says, I don't cease to make mention of you in my prayers. That the Lord, God of our Lord Jesus, the Father, that he may grant to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Are you hearing me? Of insight into the mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. Are you hearing me? By having the eyes of your understanding flooded with light. So that you can know and understand the hope which he has called you. And how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is, so you can know the Bible says, and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength that you will know how much is available for you. Now we see that in Ephesians, Paul prays for this cause. This is the reason he's praying for you. But every time Paul is praying for the church, you're going to realize he's praying that they will know. Not that they will receive. That they will know. <laughs> Imagine somebody making this prayer. I pray that you know how many trillions of dollars are on your account. How many cars are for you? How much wealth is yours? How much divine health is yours? I am praying to God that you'll understand that that landlord you're worried about, in a few weeks, you're going to be his landlord. I pray. You understand? Imagine a man of God boldly making that prayer for you. And you're in a state where you can't fully understand what they're praying. Because the circumstance around you is so contrary to what you choose God to believe. That is what I'm speaking to you. That is the essence of what I'm sharing tonight. So when he says that we are laborers together with him, he means to say that I have given you everything. I am so working through you and in you that there is stuff I can't do without you. I need you present. Saints, God needs us. You know, some people say, you see, God doesn't need you. Me, he needs me. He needs me. Mm -hmm. Praise God. But he doesn't need you. He can use anyone. Yes, if he goes to that person, again, he will need another person, but he will need a man. That's how humble God is. Praise God. Now, this is my heart. I believe that every other day, as we are reminded, some of us, as we are taught, some of us, we are coming to that reality every day. And the evidence will be on how your life will start to change and transform every other day. When I started preaching the gospel, I found many men who could preach such things. But years later, I still found that they were still in the same place I found them when they were preaching these things. And I understood that they only spoke for the mind what was not revealed to their spirits. You can't have this revelation in your spirit and fail. It's not possible. That is why more than ever before, I understand why Paul says, I don't cease to pray. Because sometimes they have the mystery of his will, but it's not fully understood. It's not fully believed. It's not fully comprehended. Like again, I said, there are certain teachings by the Spirit that can only be received and clearly defined when you choose to believe that you have certain things already in Christ. I've seen that the imitations of the spirit are not only in doing what you see another do, but they also come in, come, sorry, in the, in the full understanding of your oneness with God. You realize that the imitations are not self-propelled 
but rather as a yielded vessel to God, they are God propelled. It is God that works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. That working, the sunagos, that oneness with collaborating with God, it means even them working together with him, I'm not working together with him as one besides him, fulfilling a common vision. No, I'm working together with him as one who has ceased and him now is working in me. When you understand that, how can you fear to pray for the sick? How can you be intimidated by disease? How can you be intimidated by anything? You have, you'll start to see more and more of your prayers answered through the simple proclamation of faith. If you understand these things, you'll be fruitful. You'll be fruitful. Praise God. Just open your mouth and speak. Come on, speak. Speak. I believe in what God is doing in your life. I believe that he has made known unto you the mystery of his will. I believe that you have an action from on high and you know all things. Come on, pray. I believe that divine health is yours. I believe that favor is yours. I believe that the glory of God is upon you. I believe that you're changing the world. I believe that you're not an ordinary man. I believe that you're not an ordinary woman. I believe that you have voice in this generation. I believe that greatness is your testimony and your story. I believe that you're shaking your generation. I believe that you're writing history. Come on. Speak upon your family. Speak upon your children. Speak on your body. Thank him for the completeness that you have in him. Thank him because he are complete. Rando Robo Shira Baba. Right now I feel your mouth is creating things. Your spirit is creating things. I charge you by God to create. 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 Bring to the realization of every promise on your life. Every promise on your body. Every promise of your family. Every prophecy spoken of you by men of God, by the Bible, by scripture by everything speak ra la la ba kosa ba kata bro sere be ke sere le ba i sense an elevation by god i sense an elevation by god i sense a raising up by the spirit of god i sense things changing Power of the Holy Ghost. Power of the Holy Ghost. Shalelele bros. The life of God is in you. His power is working through you. Come on. Dig deeper. Dig deeper. Let it leave your mind and enter your spirit. Let that reality
granite your soul. Reteke rebakatalaba. Karebo zele mandorobo zabakashakatalaba. Let incurable disease leave your body right now in the name of Jesus. Let poverty leave your house right now in the name of Jesus. Let struggle leave you in the name of Jesus. Let ignorance depart from you. Let laxity depart from you. Let that weakness leave in the mighty name of Jesus. That addiction, I cast it to the root in the name of Jesus. Now commend yourself to the world. Let the world receive you in peace. Let the world receive you in glory. Let men understand you in honor. Because you are ordained to the praise and glory of his name. May the glory of God rise upon you. May his presence increase on you. May his understanding increase on you. May his favor overflow you. May these things override you. May they flip you and fill you. May you be drowned in the reality of God's goodness, God's glory, God's power, God's wisdom, God's influence. May you change the world. May things happen so quick for you and so fast as you flow by the winds of the Spirit. May God take you quicker. May God strengthen you. May God enlarge your territory. May you occupy. May you change this world. May the media listen in the mighty name of Jesus. May the social systems bow to the God that is upon you. May the political systems bow to the God that is upon you. May the philosophies of this world be slapped to nothing by the glory and the anointing of God upon your life. May the intelligence of men cease. May the interpretations of men cease. May the canalities of understanding cease. May the optics of men's vision cease. May you see as God sees. And I want you to tell your soul, I must change this world. I want you to tell your soul that I'm a wonder. I said I'm a wonder. The communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. That is our labor, that you might be perfect in Christ. Oh, glory. Thank you because we are completing you. Rabata rabaka shakatala baba. Rekete rimandoro bobo shalababa yekete. Shabayara baba lalale. May that evidence be on your house. May the evidence of his glory be on your home. May the evidence of his glory be on your business. May it be on your ministry. I repeat, may it be on your ministry. May it be on your children. May it be on your spouse. May it be on the land you stand. May it go in the place that you go. May it be, may it be. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to give the Lord a mighty clap of praise. Come on, clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. Clap for Jesus. Clap like you know. Clap like you are grateful. There is nothing lacking. You have everything that pertains to life and godliness. You have it all. Money, you have it all. Divine health, you have it all. Don't be intimidated by altars, pulpits. Don't be intimidated by televisions and cameras. Don't be intimidated by the interviews you're sent to. Don't be intimidated by the nations you enter. You have more than they have. For greater is he which is in you than he that is in the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Come on, give him a praise. I believe it. Lord, I believe it. Rabba kata laba sheti. I believe it. Robo tolo mando robo kosha. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. The sufficiency is not of us. As to think of anything by us. But the sufficiency is of God. Let me tell you something. 
I had not planned to say this, but let me say it. It's in such meetings that anointings that change nations come. It's in such meetings that anointings that shake continents come. It's in such sermons that anointings that change communities come. It's in such meetings that bushels are taken off lights and men are exposed into the world. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Put your hand on your head. Say in the name of Jesus. Say in the name of Jesus. The world will hear me. The world will see my God. The world will respond to that being in the inside of me. Say in the name of Jesus. I will not be an average man or woman. Say in the name of Jesus. This world is mine. To the glory of God. Say in the name of Jesus. What is upon me goes beyond my color. My relatives. My education. My connection. Those I know and those I don't know. It separates my voice from the noises. What is upon me is putting a distinctive mark from the rest of the men in the world. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that I'm placed in a place where the world will see my God and glorify him. For I was ordained for nations. I was not called for small things. I was called for big things. I was called to change the world. Here I come to the glory of God. Give the Lord a mind hang of a praise. It is done. It is done. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. Now I want to finish. If you're here and as you heard me preaching, you said, I want to receive that God. I'm not born again, but after hearing you, I feel like I need to receive that Jesus. If you felt that as I was speaking, I was speaking to you. You're going to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I have heard the word today. My heart has chosen to believe you. The Bible says, with the heart a man believes and confession is made to righteousness. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.